uh, situated behind me, uh, to acknowledge that, uh, that where I sit right now is located in Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, this territory was actually uh, covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which were signed back in 1725. Uh, between the, the Mi'kmaq and Wulistuwik peoples or Maliseet peoples uh, with the British crown. Uh, these treaties did not deal with the surrender of, our, of these lands and resources, but rather they recognized the, these two peoples title and established uh, sort of rules of the game for uh, ongoing relationships. Uh, several uh, years ago, we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in this country and um, it revealed uh, what was no surprise to many, many people, which was just a, a systemic uh, racism uh, that existed for our Indigenous peoples. And as a result, institutions like this university uh, have been taking many steps to try to address that. Uh, far too late and far too little. In many cases, we have a long way to go. But I just wanted to let you know that um, the Cody Institute uh, last week uh, launched a circle of abundance uh, a nationwide or coast to coast to coast initiative for Indigenous women leaders uh, led by our alumni, um, a three year initiative. Uh, the, the elder, the knowledge keeper in residence at this university is located here at the Cody Institute, as well as the Indigenous Lounge, uh, which we have created in the last couple of years. Uh, in addition, we are, are the Cody Chair in Social Justice. Um, this afternoon is having an action forum in which they're bringing recommendations back, which are encouraging the chair to be moved from a visiting chair model to an actual fund that will support building deeper relationships between this university, including the Cody and our surrounding indigenous and, and African Nova Scotia communities. And tonight, uh, for the first time, this university is leading a, a, a virtual uh, education for settlers event to help educate people in our area around treaty rights, in particular as it regards to First Nations fishery and resource use uh, around moderate livelihood. So small steps, much more to do, but I do wanna acknowledge that this uh, land acknowledgement is just not a land acknowledgement. It's a series of steps that institutions such as ours continually have to make to try to deal with, um, with a systemic racism that has existed for many, many, uh, centuries. So thank you, Yogesh, and good luck with the webinar. Thank you, Gart. Uh, and uh, it is uh, a pleasure for me to, to welcome uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to, uh, to Cody and welcome to our webinar series. Uh, my name is Yogesh Gore. I'm a senior program staff here at the, uh, at the Cody Institute. Uh, and uh, me and and uh, Farooq uh, Farooq Jiva, um, uh, who is who is a senior associate here, and, and, and a social entrepreneur himself. Uh, Farooq and I, uh, we started uh, a course on future of work and uh, workers um, uh, <clears throat> post pandemic, and uh, this series uh, is is this webinar series is part of uh, uh, part of that uh, initiative. So let me. Um, quickly give you just a little bit of context uh, to the kitchen table dialogue because there is a significant historical context attached to it uh, there is that's why we are calling it a, a, a kitchen table uh, dialogue so <clears throat> i think uh, uh, this kitchen table uh, meetings were started uh, by uh, this university 100 years back in response to the economic challenges uh, that the communities, local communities in Atlantic Canada were facing back in the 20s and the 30s, including the Great uh, Depression. And with this series of kitchen table meetings, uh, uh, Moses Cody and colleagues started uh, a, a revolution that turned into a, a movement for social and economic justice that transformed this, this region and saw a, a vibrant community institutions, cooperatives, credit unions uh, flourish uh, almost 100 years back. And our institute was born out of that movement and, and, and the same learning and principles we, we took to the world uh, including to, to Africa, that is, that is today's focus. So building on that, that history of those kitchen table meetings during the pandemic, uh, um, everything was closed down and, and we thought, uh, and, and there were a lot, lot of talk around, around uh, building back better and, and creating a new economy. 
at that point in time, I think we at, at the institute thought that it's it's it, it is it is important for us to uh, to talk about these big issues, but also talk in a way that that involves people and and explains what the what these these big issues are. So that's when we started this series back in in June. Uh, this is the seventh in in the series. We have we have over five hundred uh, people join us for these conversations, uh, and, uh, and and today's one specifically is is focused on on Africa and future of work. Now, before uh, we begin, uh, before I, I invite Farooq, can I request everybody to please turn on your uh, videos for a minute, if possible? And uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Uh, either you can raise your hand in the video, or you can uh, you can use the Zoom function uh, to raise your hand. So tell me, how many of you are joining today from Antigonish? Town of Antigonish. Only Alison? Okay, two, three. How many are joining from Nova Scotia, Canada? You can raise the Zoom hand as well. Um, Darlene, I am. Dar I work at Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia. How many are joining from North America? How many from Asia? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. How many from the continent of Africa? About oh, 10 people. Okay. Uh, how many from the Caribbean? What we have a couple. Yeah, from Haiti. Okay. Any anybody else whom I have missed? Any other uh, continent or country that I have missed? Latin America. Uh, is there anyone from Latin America? Great. So I think it's uh, uh, so, so from. Asia. Oh yes, yes, Mansi Ben. I, 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 yeah. I, I think I, I said Asia, and then there, there are quite a number from from Asia. So thank you, everyone. Uh, this kind of conversation, I think this, uh, this, I mean, uh, this kitchen table is 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 far bigger. Uh, we we actually have a, a huge representation from all across the world. So with that, uh, I will invite uh, Farooq to introduce uh, the panelists uh, for today. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, Yogesh. Um, it, it's really a pleasure to have with us uh, Misan, uh, Alim, and Sharmi. And I want to just quickly tell you a little bit about who they are before we kind of hand over to them for this really, really interesting conversation today on uh, what's happening in, uh, in Africa from their perspective. All of them are on the continent, and I think their unique vantage point is something that I think we'll all benefit to, to learn more about uh, in the discussion today. Um, <clears throat> Misan Rewane was born in Lagos, and she's no stranger to the challenges of education and social mobility. When her parents, who were unable to ignore the education system's breakdown, were compelled to send her to the U.S. for university, she resolved to help transform the region's education system. And after graduating from Stanford University, she worked at the Monitor Group, TechnoServe, and the Center for Public Policy Alternatives. As an MBA uh, candidate at the Harvard Business School, she partnered with fellow West Africans who were passionate about tackling youth unemployment and launched WAVE in 2013. WAVE tackles youth unemployment by growing the supply of, uh, uh, of work-ready youth while growing the demand from employers, thereby leveling the playing field for African youth to access the skills and opportunities to become what they imagine. Ms. Nan is also the co-founder of the Impact Initiative, a nonprofit focused on helping young people discover themselves and maximize their academic, career, and personal experiences. She is very passionate about supporting innovative companies in scaling their impact sustainably and serves as a strategic advisor to a range of organizations, including the ArtX Collective, NLA, Enter5, and Hugo. She now sits on the boards of Wave, Kepler, Inner Tide Foundation, 
and the African Visionary Fund. Uh, and uh, um, Ms. Nan is joining us from Lagos, Nigeria this morning. Um, Sharmi Suryanarayan serves as the Chief, Chief Impact Officer of Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator in South Africa. Sharmi is a fierce advocate of, uh, for opportunity and social justice for young people and women across the African continent. Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator develops African solutions for the global challenge of youth unemployment. She leads on Harambe's impact and systems change agendas and also oversees their work in new markets. Sharmi brings extensive experience in human capital management, education, and facilitating links to employment across Africa, India, and the United States. Uh, she serves as the Vice President of Lifelong Engagement at the African Leadership Academy, where she oversaw a network of 2,000 young African leaders, managed Africa, uh, Africa Leadership Academy's MasterCard Foundation Scholarship Program, uh, the African Careers Network, and the ALA's alumni engagement team as well. Uh, Sharmi is an Aspen African Leadership Initiative Fellow, class of 2020 and sits on the board of emerging public leaders, Ongoza, Métis, in still education, and is on the advisory council for the next gen ecosystem builders Africa 2020. She holds a BA from Harvard University, a master's degree from the uh, Graduate School of Education at Harvard, and a master's degree from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. And last but not least is Alim Lada. Uh, Alim is the founder of Instill Education, a recently accredited private university startup aiming to transform the quality of learning in every African classroom through evidence-informed tech-enabled interventions for pre-service and in-service teachers and school leaders. Alim is passionate about education and the challenges presented by rising and persistent youth unemployment, particularly in Africa. Prior to launching Instill, he was an executive in charge of innovation at Harambe's Youth Employment Accelerator, where he worked in experiment with innovative education uh, ecosystems uh, to the systemic failures that exist between the education system and the labor market in South Africa. Um, he was also the founding CEO of the Africa Leadership University, uh, was one of the fast companies, most innovative companies, uh, a startup seeking to reimagine higher education for uh, the 21st century in Africa. Uh, previously, Alim was a leader of McKinsey and Company's education and organizations practices where he led projects in 30 plus countries uh, primarily supporting labor market and education reforms and uh, across the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Uh, Alim currently serves on the board of Streetlight Schools and is an advisor to several education startups in the Middle East and Africa. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal and an MBA from INSEAD's program in France and Singapore. So, an incredibly accomplished group of people. Uh, we're very, very lucky to have them today. And um, Alim, I understand you wanted to do a bit of a, a quick check-in with our with participants to see how much they know about the African continent. Absolutely. Um, these buyers are a mouthful. I need to figure out how to make it much, much shorter. Um, and uh, so welcome everybody. And thank you for having both Sharmi and Nassan. Uh, we promised that we're gonna make this a uh, a real kitchen table conversation. So, you know, Nissan and Sharmi know each other well, and we're gonna try and have a conversation with each other about the challenges, but also with uh, with all of you, hopefully through the chat box. So what I wanted to do uh, first is set maybe a bit of the context. Um, so this is the Cody Institute. Um, you are part of a higher education institution. So it's quiz time, or we're actually going to do a quiz to start. And we're going to check a bit, uh, how well do you know the African continent? And uh, as, as you're going through some of the questions, and there's only 10 multiple choice questions, uh, I want you to do two things. One, I want you to use the chat to put in your answer uh, so that I can check that you can use the chat to also pose questions as we're, as we're talking. Um, but also, I also want you to think about how much of the African context is similar to where you are. 
uh, but how much of it is also very different to where you are. So on that note, let me share my screen. Um, and the format of this is, let me see if I can just close things that are not meant to be near. Um, screen, share. Yep. You can all see my screen, fantastic. Um, so let's start with uh, maybe the first question. And that, that one is a very, very, very complicated question, right? Let's just set the context on the African continent. So how many countries on the African continent? And you have four choices. Africa is a country. That's a joke. Please don't answer that. Um, 34, 47, 54. And I'm going to let you use the chat to, uh, to, to just put answers in there. Great, I think that one is relatively simple. Um, 54 countries on the African continent, the African Union may debate some of the numbers here, but 50, 54 countries according to the UN. Let's go a bit more difficult now. How many people live on the African continent? And this is a 2018 estimate. Um, you've got four choices and I've tried to give you a bit of an anchor um, against some of the larger geographies, um, such as uh, China and India, just for you to get a sense. Okay, so this one, I didn't see many completely correct answer, but you're not completely off. Um, the population is about 1.22 billion in 2018, but actually growing about 6% a year. And that number is really important because uh, as we talk about some of the challenges the continent faces, the population growth actually has an impact on some of these challenges and the incredible opportunity the continent presents itself. Um, Sharmi Misan, uh, starting the next question, I'm gonna ask you to share a perspective on why some of these things matter uh, as we enter into a bit more uh, specific questions. So the next question is, how many on the African continent are under the age of 29? So what we define as the young, less than 35, about 40, about 50, about 65% or more than 65%. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it or to Google it if you're going to Google it on your side. So here's the, uh, the, the interesting fact. Um, it's more than 65% of the continent is less than 29 years old currently. Um, I think the, the, uh, the average age of an African, the median age is 20 years old right now. It's actually 19 in, in some of the recent facts that I've actually seen. And so uh, Misan Charmi, I'd love for you to just maybe spend 30 seconds telling us why this matters and why this, this number is particularly important. I can start maybe then, Misan. I can't see you on my screen, sorry. Um, yeah, this number is uh, really important, primarily because Africa is the youngest country in the world and is going to be the youngest country for a while. So I think it's, we're going to be about 800 million young people in 2050. And um, it will therefore be also the largest workforce of the world um, in, in um, a similar period of time. So the question is, how do you actually engage young people? And I think for me, a critical mindset perspective is not looking at young people as the problem instead of using them as an asset. So how can this asset of young people, this is incredible. I have a, an argument with Alim about the tsunami you saw on the first slide, because it's in some ways it's, it's yes, it is a problem when you don't have engaged and act, economically active young people, but they're also a huge asset capable of so much. And so, and I know Alim concurs on that front. So um, how do you think of this huge youth population in Africa as a global asset? And how do you keep them busy and engaged and, um, and economically active is, is a huge no, 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 no. So Sharmi, just to say, you, you didn't mean to say that Africa isn't a country. You said Africa is the country that we'll have. So I'm just correcting you before. Yes, before. Um, thank you. So, it was preempted a bit, and Misan, I'll let you answer this question as people answer, but what percentage of the world under 18 will be in Africa by 2050? I think Sharmi gave you a bit of a, of a perspective here. Um, so I'll jump straight to the answer you don't need to answer. 
but about 40% of the, the, the world's young will be in Africa by 2050, right? Um, obviously, the, these projections depend on whose number you're looking at, but there is generally a consensus that between 40 and 50% of the world's young will be on the African continent by 2050, right? Um, if you look at the chart that's there, it's effectively the projection of the global growth of youth population from 1950 to 2100. This was a World Bank, uh, McKinsey and UN joint task force. And the African continent is the only one, you'll see the blue line that just cuts across, the light blue line that just cuts across and keeps growing, is the only place in the world where the amount, the, the, the youth population is actually aggressively growing, right? Uh, if, you, if you look at overall Asia, you're actually seeing a decline. The dynamic may be different in specific countries, but as a whole region, this is, uh, this is an important uh, dynamic here. Let me get to maybe to the next question. Um, the, the, the next series of questions are talking a bit more about some of the contextual challenges on the African continent uh, that affects, particularly when we start talking about the future of work and the future of skills on the African continent. So the question for you is, how many African cities have today more than a million people? Um, and, I, and I think for, for those of you in Canada, as a Canadian, th this number always baffled me, right? Because we don't have too many Canadian cities that are over a million people uh, out there. So there are currently 52 cities with populations of more than a million people. That number is expected to grow to 65 in the next five to seven years. Um, I, I'll call upon Misa in just a second right now, but if you look at again this chart, which was an economist study that was done a, a few years back, you have um, cities such as um, Lagos, Kinshasa, Cairo, who are starting to hit the 15, 20, 25 million. Uh, a recent conversation I had with, uh, with, with a, uh, a policymaker in, in the DRC was that his estimate was that a city like Kinshasa was adding about a million people a year right now. Every year, a million people are either migrating into Kinshasa or the population is growing there. And the, again, the impact of that is uh, on work, on skills, on systems is quite important. Misan, maybe a quick reflection here, particularly because you know, Lagos is arguably today one of the largest cities in the world and on the continent. Yes. Um, no, just to point out that, you know, 90 plus percent of these young people will not have access to higher education. Well, until ALU, like skills and, and all the other <laughs> interesting interventions for tertiary education. But the reality is that I think in, in the U.S. and in Western countries, maybe about just over 20 percent of the population is, is acquiring a higher education. But in Africa, that's below 10 percent. And so these are young people who pretty much from the age of 16, 17 um, are unemployed, unemployable, frustrated, and have similar aspirations to their peers around the world. They want to self-determine. Um, they want the skills. They want the economic opportunity. And so I definitely agree with Sharmi that it is full of potential but it is also um, something that we all have to pay attention to. So when I speak to businesses, I tell them that you cannot afford to not be on top of what the local secondary school in your neighborhood is teaching, because that's the last bus stop for 70% of the young people, because we still have 30% that will never even enroll in a secondary school um, if we continue at our current rate. So the amount of leapfrogging that we have to do, we cannot afford to innovate at the same rate as everyone else we have to be leapfrogging at, at 10x than everyone else. So it is urgent, it is important, and these are important conversations I'm excited to be a part of. Awesome. So one, two things I want you to remember from, from this part of the, from this slide is urbanization is an important uh, dynamic that is, that is actually uh, shaping African cities generally. And the second one is the solution space will require us to be unconventional. Uh, challenge existing paradigms because otherwise, as Misan said well, the last bus stop for many is secondary education. In many cases, it isn't very good secondary education uh, out there. Um, the second one, and, I, and it, this is real, and, and I saw um, I saw one of your colleagues from Zimbabwe write on the on the on the chat that he had some power issue. But 
what percentage of Africans have access to electricity uh, right now? So I'll let you, yeah. It's a quick one, it's, it, there's no trick question. We're still at around 42% uh, right now. Um, again, this is, this is a space where um, the African continent is massively innovating with unconventional solutions. Uh, anywhere between personal uh, solar panels that go onto your home to different payment plans on how do you actually integrate that. So it also has implication of how we start to think about the paradigm of online learning and distance learning and all that. This is actually some of the infrastructure challenges we're facing. And uh, as we start thinking about unconventional solution, the idea that um, putting everything online and making it accessible is going to solve that is not going to be it because we still have 43% uh, of Africans that have access to reliable electricity. The rest of them are still trying to catch up to that. So keep that in mind as we're talking about solution spaces. Um, question eight, um, I think this is an important, uh, an important dynamic that is going to also affect you know, the African continent. But I, I actually think this is going to shape uh, the world is how many Africans are projected to be exposed to an increased water stress to climate change by 2025. So that's just a, again, a climate change angle to some of the forces that are shaping the continent. So the current estimate, according to the UN and the climate change, uh, the IPCC is that about 250 million African, a quarter of the continent right now, could be vulnerable and exposed to water stress in the next three to four years. Um, about 50% of all agricultural crops could be at risk. Now, I want you to think about, again, this particular dynamic from a context of how that drives urbanization, but how that drives migration, right? How that, that, that uproots communities out of where they are, trying to get to a place where they can survive. And the role, uh, if you go back to what Sharmi talked about earlier, workforce of the world, it's also a migrating workforce. Uh, and the forces that are shaping these migrations are just appearing now and will continue growing as we're starting to, to figure out the unconventional solutions we're talking about. Promise, the quiz is almost over. Two more questions. And we're going we're gonna to switch to a, more of an education and employment uh, as a segue to our conversation. Um, what's the youth unemployment rate in Africa? So here's the thing. According to the ILO, the youth employment rate in Africa is one of the lowest in the world compared to other regions. It's around 10, 12, 15% if you look at the numbers you're looking at. But actually, that youth employment rate is reflective. Uh, it's, it's actually not a great reflection of the, the state of the labor market in uh, economies that have high informality right, and poor social protection sch schemes uh, where people are. Right? People are basically forced to do petty jobs to survive. They're in, that, uh, in, in the bottom of the economy. We're talking about, we're going to talk a bit later about the economy. But I also think that as you look at this number, I think there is an opportunity for us to look at this as, um, in many ways, young Africans have been socialized into the gig economy, economy that hustle economy, quite a lot. Right? It hasn't been um, gainful, great employment. But fundamentally, they've had to fend for themselves and their family from a very, very young age, which in some way makes them a bit more, I wouldn't say comfortable, but uh, you know, have the skills to navigate these, uh, these more ephemeral, much more, um, uh, much more um, non-permanent uh, solutions to earning uh, for them and for their families. I, I'll pause here. Maybe Sharmi, Misan, you want to add something to this. And I, I think given the work the two of you do uh, and have done, that might be a good place to just Hear some of your reflections. Yeah, sure. I mean, I can add to that, Aleem. I think the number is incredibly deceptive. And I think the big, so a statistic that stands out for me is one in six young Africans is in wage employment. So you don't have lots of young people doing formal sector jobs. And like Ali mentioned, there's a huge informal economy in Africa. 
um, that masks this, this unemployment. And there's this chronic underemployment as well. So basically people aren't being, aren't maximizing their potential or in sort of low equilibrium, low wage, low potential jobs that unfortunately don't allow them to escape poverty or really stabilize themselves and have a pathway to success. Um, and for me, Ooh. there's so many different issues here that we could talk about. Um, but I think for me, the, the bigger issue is given this situation, I feel like the African continent, because it's at the crossroads of so many interesting global dynamics, solving Africa's unemployment ch challenge could be a prototype for the world, I think. I firmly believe that, actually, because I think there's so many things that are happening in Africa, um, you know, We've inherited legacy colonial education that no longer serves us now. We are at the crossroads where jobs are actively being destroyed. And then we're also in this space where there's this future of work and fourth industrial revolution. So for me, I think being in the role that I am, I feel like prototyping a solution for the African continent will actually solve something that maybe pre predates what the world might end up facing in many in, in a few years time even. So that also gives me hope. I'm, a, I'm an incurable optimist. And so I, that's why I believe that the work we have to do is to figure that out. And Nissan has you know, great experience in this space as well. Yes, um, definitely agree that the opportunities to innovate and sort of be the, at the forefront of how we fix this issue um, and, and leverage the potential really does rest with Africa. Um, just wanted to add that interesting dynamics around the hustle economy and entrepreneurship. So I think in a lot of African countries, about a third of, of, of Africans are engaged in entrepreneurial activity. And they do this you know, not because there's a burning problem that they're passionate about solving, but it's, it's sort of the new subsistence farming. So our parents' generation 70% of the population engaged in, in farming that couldn't scale. And, and now you have majority of the population engaged in entrepreneurship and hustles that cannot afford to feed them at a steady and secure rate. Um, business failure, business survival rate is, you know, one in two of these businesses is what I heard from a colleague who does similar work in Uganda um, is failing. And so there is definitely an opportunity to work in both enterprise skills that involve entrepreneurship and employability and, and, and being an entrepreneur is hard as a lot of us can attest to, um, but the drive and the wherewithal for African young Africans is there. And so there is the opportunity to one, grow the formal economy sector um, as an off taker for young people, but also to help them figure out how to tackle a lot of the current problems around climate change um, through entrepreneurship as well. So I'm excited to also explore that. Brilliant. Um, last question, and I'll stop. And I think some of you already answered is, how many young Africans enter the workforce every year or are entering the age of work as, as, as defined by the ILO? Um, I'll give you like 10 seconds to figure this one out. Um, um, and the answer is quite yeah. simple. You're looking at about 10 to 12 million young people are entering the workforce across the continent every year. So by 2030, you'll have about 125 million young people entering the workforce, which actually I think the important point is that it's more than the rest of the world combined. Right? It is more than the rest of the world combined. And so as we, uh, as we enter our, our, maybe our conversation and, and, and we'll start our, our, our kitchen table conversation now, um, maybe take a step back, uh, Nissan uh, and Sharmi, and tell me um, tell me a bit about the skills that that young Africans are going to need to be successful in in this in the particular space. Nissan, how would you start? Um, I think what's exciting is that a lot of the skills that we think are going to be even more relevant in the future are, are human-centered skills that are going to be harder to automate. So um, I have this argument with my partner a lot around is curiosity the more important or is it drive and motivation? You have someone who's gritty and hungry and will hit their that problem, that hustle mentality, that drive, 
that resilience is that is that going to get someone further than than the innate curiosity that helps you then develop your critical thinking your creative thinking which are also skills that are are just as important um and so it's, it's hard to distill it down to an essential three or five but oh dear um okay can you i think you can still hear me I can uh, yeah. still hear so it, it's hard to distill it down to an essential three or five but if i had to i would say it's curiosity, um, drive and motivation as a trait, if not a skill. Um, multidisciplinary thinking, this. Yeah, I'm really not sure who put it on. Uh, yeah, so, so multidisciplinary thinking, um, just the ability to take ideas from different different sectors and have that conversation um, and, and take initiative. I think a lot of people, that's one place where Africans have the ability to take initiative and just solve problems rapidly because that's all you're, you're being thrown into from the day you're born. Oh, oh okay. Sorry, it might be my connection. Um, is it better now? It oh, is dear. better now. Let's keep trying. I think it might be my connection. Charmi, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Um, sorry about that, Nissan, because you were saying some really juicy stuff. And I think for me, um, I completely agree with you, especially on the drive. Oh, okay. um, um, can sorry, you hear sorry. me, Nissan? Yeah, sorry, can, can you hear? Oh, okay. Um, so I think problem solving, curiosity, drive, I think Nissan hit the nail on the head with drive in particular. Uh, what we're seeing with it's interesting, you know, we see obviously there's not going to be enough jobs generated for the young people, Ali mentioned 10 to 12 million enter the workforce every year. There's about 3 million formal sector jobs being generated every year. If that, and those, those are gonna be hit badly by COVID and also will uh, reduce over time as well. So drive is a critical one we see, especially at the bottom of the pyramid in terms of thinking of hustle and improving your hustle. Now, a lot of young Africans are naturally sort of um, really gifted at making the most of, of a tough situation. But how do you, in addition to just having that hustle, how do you actually convey that skill to the labor market? How do you build on that skill um, and make it count, I think is the really important question. So there's a whole host of skills Misan talked about um, you know, problem solving, critical thinking, curiosity, drive. Um, I would definitely say also understanding how to distill and extract key information and make connections. Um, in, we're seeing increasingly with digital um, knowledge, it's not about sheer rote content, uh, absorption of content, which has unfortunately been the legacy of most educational institutions. Most educational institutions around the world, but particularly in Africa, are very trapped in this, you know, you must memorize, you must know concepts, you, know, you need to know information versus you need to understand problems and actually solve things. So um, it's very hard to undo a lot of those things. And I think the skills for the 21st century are global skills. They're just as relevant here on the African continent. But I think what we're dealing with in addition is undoing a lot of the legacy work and the legacy <laughs> inherited institutions that unfortunately don't emphasize those skills. Um, I mean, I see this in my children's school and they go to a fancy uh, private school, but it's just as relevant in a public school as well. So you're seeing interestingly that the skills gap is actually cuts across class as well, I would say, just in terms of where we see young people across the African continent. So we do really need innovative solutions um, in the education level, on the education to employment continuum, and across the board. So, and I know that Alim is both um, an advisor to and building many of those solutions as is Nissan. So we're in good company, but we need many, many more of these as well. What I'll add to that, and I think this is something that it's, it's a point of view that, uh, that a lot of the, the researchers in South Africa are landing on is that at the core, we still have some literacy and numeracy issues, right? And so in, in some ways, the, it isn't just about you training people for the wrong things. One of the charts that I was showing shows that unemployment at the tertiary level is actually higher than the secondary level in, in that definition. But actually we have literacy and numeracy gaps where if you look at, for instance, like a country like South Africa, um, I think 75% of young people that are grade nine cannot actually read at a level of grade nine, cannot actually do basic mathematics of grade nine. For, and actually some of the, the research shows that they're probably performing at a grade four, grade five level. So 
in that context, you're also starting to think about skills gap and closing the skills gap, but you're, and, and, and it goes back to finding the right mindset and provide the right opportunities for young people to go and demonstrate their drive because um, it, it, it is no fault of their own in the end. It's a, it's a failure of the education system and the system generally that they're ending up there. And despite that, you see an incredible drive and willing to, willingness to, to, to actually acquire skills, earn a dignified living. I saw that in one of the, the comments earlier, right? So the question to you guys, Sharmi and Misan, is um, we keep talking about how um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an image that we always use on the African continent is that we didn't go down, down the path of installing fixed lines for everybody, right? We just leap to the mobile, to the mobile revolution. And in many ways, um, our mobile revolution is going on for 20 years. Um, and, and we're really excited for you North Americans with Apple Pay, like really excited. We've had M-Pesa for 20 years. Uh, that works just as well, uh, if not better. Uh, but I wanted to, to talk about, we talk about education wanting to do the same thing, right? Like how do we actually leapfrog and not replicate the models that we inherited from the colonial era, but also as we look at, um, you know, our standards, our gold standards being the UK, the US, Canada, and others, um, what, what are innovators in Africa doing to start leapfrogging some of the challenges that you have? And maybe Misan, like, given that you had one of the leapfrogging institutions, uh, tell us a bit about how you've gone about approaching this and what else are you seeing on the African continent? Sure. Um, sorry about my connection. So I'll just keep the video off just to be on the safe side. Can you hear me? Okay. We can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, no, I, I think part of the, the challenge has been sort of how do you upskill, reskill um, young people who have already been shortchanged by the system um, as separate from also the growing and urgent and important problem of people who are still in the system. Um, and so we're finding, you know, seven, eight years ago when we started on this journey, there weren't many players in the post-secondary um, education to the employment alternative pathways space. And now there's a lot of activity in that space I'm very excited about um, where you have things like COVID that have definitely accelerated the ability for these institutions to reach young people virtually. Um, but majority of the young people, as you mentioned, do not have access to connectivity um, as well as power. And so you are still finding brick and mortar solutions where um, skills training providers are bringing young people into classrooms and still training them, um, but in more dynamic ways on these life skills. Um, growing up in, in our day, we didn't have um, classes on teamwork um, or, or problem solving or managing expectations and, and multidisciplinary thinking, but how are you simulating these things in tandem with employers? I think that's the one of the key innovations that I've seen over the last five, six, seven years is folks working hand in hand with employer partners to design curriculum, to design apprenticeships that are going to teach young people um, these skills. And apprenticeships aren't anything new, um, but they're now being done at grander scales, partly because of the gig economy, which we'll talk about later on. Um, but it is that co-curriculum, co-design with employers that I think is one of the exciting things. Another exciting thing is just to Charmin's earlier point about how do young people signal when they have these skills? A lot of work has now been done on better assessing these soft skills, life skills, employability skills, as you call them, but also helping employers sort of re redefine or redesign or rethink their um, hiring practices to give young people the chance to demonstrate that they have these skills through the recruitment process, um, rather than just take people who have a degree or have the furthest education. Uh, I think what still remains to be done is how you work with small and medium enterprises who have you know, fewer resources than the bigger companies to really innovate, but the pain point is real for them and they are responsible for 60, 70% of the job creation on the continent. How do you help these micro and small um, businesses 
incorporate these apprenticeship systems um, and hiring systems that are more inclusive and will signal to young people as well as signal to the education system that what matters is no longer just the ability to accumulate accumulate knowledge but these soft skills that we've also just talked about i, I also think it's not and i think this is maybe i'll call on you Sharmi. In, in, in i'm not, not sure Sharmi, do you want to add anything or there was a bit of a delay. Um, no, so what I was going to say is that actually one of the, the innovation that I see more and more on the continent and uh, perhaps a bit less in, in, in some of my networks in, in, in North America is the idea of moving away from credentialing, right? So increasing amount of interventions that are not credential focused, uh, but increasingly focused on um, uh, creating stronger ties to the employer, which requires incredible amount of work to also change the mindset of the employer to say, hey, you see this young person hasn't completed a high school degree, but actually could be perfect for, right, um, for that. And, and Charmi, maybe talk a bit more about that and obviously anything else you want to talk about. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> and building what Misan said, you know, I think the, um, firstly, it's going to take a multi-stakeholder approach to actually address many of these things. So, you know, we at Harambe have like a couple of ideas. We've partnered with several stakeholders. And I think to Alim's point around credentials, uh, both in South Africa and in Rwanda, what we've been trying to do is tell employers in particular, those that are seeking entry-level um, young people, not to necessarily just trust grades alone. A, because grades are usually a terrible proxy for what a young person can actually do in a job. And B, because if you just trusted that, you actually weed out many people for whom you know they're, they're either better competent or it's misleading. Um, and then you're not really measuring for what the job wants or requires. So I think you know Harambe over the years in almost a decade has focus specifically on understanding what is a job. So are you someone who's um, flipping burgers or are you handling calls, you know, all day? Are you doing routine work? Are you doing slightly more complex tasks, etc.? And what is your disposition towards that? It's not just what can you do? What do you like doing? Um, do you like being in an environment where you like socializing? Or do you like, you know, working on your task and just, um, you know, focusing on, on your work, etc.? So it's, it's really important for us to really diagnose what a job is for a young person, and then help build out credentialing and assessment tools that unearth those skills that help you tell you know what a good match is and you'll be surprised to find out how poor our education qualifications well many of you aren't surprised but our education qualifications are such poor proxies of any of these measures that um, usually what hiring is it's either networks or a scan of a cv in terms of where you went to school which degree you got, what grades you had. And typically many of these are both, you know, really poor indicators of what a young person can do. And it can actively, you know, advocate um, people who are not qualified for, for, for roles, et cetera. And then it also keeps the circle of hiring to a very small group of people. So I think that the, there's so many different challenges, but one of the challenges that Harambe tried to address very early on was this issue of, okay, where's the gap between you know, young people who want to access jobs who are really good and willing to do a lot, uh, but don't have the right sort of signals that the labor market values and jobs that are, you know, plentiful. And in South Africa, it's a unique kind of setup where you have high vacancies and a high unemployment rate. So clearly there was a misinformation gap. Um, I think where we've, where we've landed now is from a technology and a sort of leapfrogging uh, moment to your earlier point, Alim, is... We've re and, and it's so accelerated by COVID because we've realized that um, it's insufficient to have a smart solution. It's it's very important to have a solution that actually allows for access. So we um, we made sure that a lot of our work was very data light. Um, so data light as in it consumed less data for a young person. South Africa actually has one of the highest data costs in the world. It's three times the cost of India and Nigeria. Um, so we tried to absorb some of those data costs, a young unemployment unemployed person cannot just afford to, you know, get online to look for jobs. So how do you reduce that cost? And then how do you also advocate at a systemic level? Can you push the government to say education and employment op apps and, and platforms should be data free? Uh, why not, right? Because it's encouraging more young people to become more active in the labor market. So those are just a couple of things. But um, I mean, just one more, if I can just talk about one more example here in Kenya, where I live. Um, 
uh, you know, Misan mentioned the hustler life. And I think one organization that's really impressed me consistently, Shujaz, um, a really fantastic organization that works with over 5 million youth in Kenya. They have what's called a hustler MBA. And it's these tiny little sort of TikTok type videos that are posted on Facebook and YouTube generated by young people on how to hustle, how to grow um, better chickens or how to sell eggs, etc. And that has a huge following. And for us, I think the concept of leapfrogging is not just big, bad technology and um, huge leaps, but these tiny incremental revolutions away from learning as we knew it and just valuing the college degree. So organizations like Shuja's, organizations like Wave in Harambe, et cetera, are trying to sort of shift the norm by pushing back against some of those big institutions as well. Yes, I think you added two more. Yeah. You were trying to say two more things. Yeah. And just to, to complement that is this idea of how do you de-risk for employers this risk that they see of, of ditching the proxies of, of competence, of credentials and going for competencies. And I think that's something that we've tried to do better here on the African continent of innovative financing models where you're literally paying employers to give people a shot, um, where you can then prove that at a decent enough scale for governments to then take that up, which I'm very excited about the work around these done with the jobs bond. But how do you, again, just give employers, we've seen the difference between a young person being on an apprenticeship or what we call a job shadow for one week and 40% of the young people getting a job offer. And that doubles when they get to spend two weeks on the employer's site. So just giving the employer the chance to try before they buy um, is a huge, huge um, innovation that I've seen in this space. That's, um, another is this idea of income sharing agreements, which a lot of us had been operating without even knowing the fancy term for it. Um, being able to take that out of the formal tertiary um, education system where it's existed in the US and in Europe for many years, but now bringing it to a place where young people who aren't in school and are able to enroll in these alternative pathways and have a, uh, income that's going to come at a delayed rate, how do you then share in the future upside that they get from that job placement? And that's been something that's really been helpful for WAVE, um, just innovating in our pricing models. Farouk, you had a couple of questions um, for, for the group. Yeah, I mean, you know, listening listening into all of you guys, it obviously sounds that you're like eternal optimist. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm not even sure whether your optimism is hinged in reality. I mean, come on, where, where are the employers? Tell us a little bit about what's happening in terms of where the employers are. Tell us about where the work is. Tell us about these opportunities. You said in South Africa, there's a huge mismatch between the amount of vacancies and the number of people. Is that really true and consistent across the African continent? For those of us who, who are disconnected or detached or not on the African continent, tell us a little bit about the, the work landscape. Definitely, uh, I'll chime in there. Uh, there's, there's no argument that there aren't enough jobs to absorb the 12 million that are going to graduate um, next year into the workforce, let alone the backlog that we have. But what we have seen is the growth potential of these small and micro entrepreneurs who are already contributing to 60% of the formal sector jobs and the potential when you have the right one person, that first hire, um, when you, everyone who isn't even an entrepreneur but runs a department and manages a team, the discretionary effort of having the right person on your team because you have now hired not for the proxy of what degree they had, but actually hired for the competencies and the compatibility that they have with their culture and the kind of work that you demand of them. Um, we've seen that lead to entrepreneurs that started with us with one person and now hire 50, 60 people. Um, so yeah, we're hopeful in that multiplier effect that happens when a small business um, owner's effort is matched by someone who actually has the skills to do the job, but also the cultural traits, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the soft skills and the traits to, to meet, match their culture way of working. Sharmi, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I mean, yeah, I mean, Farouk, I think it's, the optimism is grounded in needing to figure out a plan more than anything else, because I think the, um, the truth of the matter is there will never be enough jobs, right? So I think there's 
I feel like there's three big priorities that many of us in this space have to focus on. One is to help create more jobs. Two is to connect people to those jobs efficiently and better. And three is um, to reduce barriers that young people face, whether it's by you know making things data free, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of creating more jobs, I think there's both the um, you know, focus on micro entrepreneurs and helping them hustle better. But it's no question, we do have to focus on the big investments, the big industries and, you know, job generation engines of the economy. The formal sector is important. It's not unimportant. That said, you know, um, compared to South Africa, where the vacancy rate and unemployment are both high, that doesn't, it, that's not true in the rest of the continent. So it's definitely true that it's highly competitive. I mean, when Harami moved to Rwanda, um, it was clear that most organizations didn't necessarily want to understand the business case for um, for matching based on social inclusion and, and social means, for example. They just wanted the best kids from the best universities. So it's, it's going to be a hard sell to um, demonstrate return on investment for inclusion across the board when you're in a very stiff labor market or a competitive labor market, rather. But I do think that um, by increasing jobs, it's not just let's promote big industries because those jobs don't exist. Many of those jobs will never come to Africa. That manufacturing boom that you saw that powered East Asia and South Asia isn't necessarily going to come to the African continent. And we're already in a space where there's job destruction with lots of automated jobs being destroyed. And we have the fourth industrial revolution upon us. And you see the gigification of so many jobs. So, that's why I meant, you know, prototyping a solution is critical. It involves a lot of complex moving parts. We have to design, for example, institutions at the education level, at financial inclusion level, at the tertiary sort of employment level as well, that don't look like 150 years ago. I mean, the model we have now is built on sort of your Henry Ford, you know, steady job, you go to the shop floor nine to five. These, these are not the institutions of the future. And, and, you know, the seminar series is the future of work. I think Africa is experiencing the effects of the future of work, perhaps, you know, ahead of many other countries in its sort of relatively high level of underemployment, gigification, lack of jobs, and, and, an, and an education system that doesn't meet the needs of the workforce. So we really need rapid lots of solutions. Um, so we can't not increase the formal sector jobs, but we have to figure out other alternate ways as well to keep young people engaged and, and relevant to the economy. Liam, what do you think about all of this? I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with, with Charmi and, and, and actually Misan on, on this. I, I, I do think that, and, and I see some of the comments uh, coming up uh, in there, is the, the, reality of it, the reality is we don't have an option to do an or, right? We don't have an option on the continent to think about it from an or perspective. So do our tertiary education system need to be reformed and improved and be better connected to the needs of, of, uh, of the workplace? Absolutely, right? So one of the things that we're experimenting with the, the university that, that I recently launched is the idea of dismantling the barrier that exists between pre-service and, and in-service, right? The idea that you go to school, then you go to work makes no sense to us, right? So how about we reimagine higher education or perspective of why not look at it as a Netflix subscription, right? You kind of accumulate these credentials or these micro-credentials over a period of time. And as you, uh, as you actually gain the skills and earn, uh, you can actually demonstrate some form of competence to be able to enter the workforce. That resonates with some of the young people we talk to because they look at me and they say, well, I want to be able to go to university. My parents want me to go there. There's enough, not enough seat. Or if there, if I, even if I get in, I can't actually afford it. And even if you give me a student loan, I can't actually afford to take time off of being able to take care of my family, right? And so we're forced to think about how tertiary education needs to look different. And we, we're forced to think about some of these unconventional idea that, uh, that generation, Harambi, Wave, uh, Moringa in Kenya, and I can keep going about these, are thinking about just rapid skilling of people. And we're forced to think about um, some of the more generic skills that everybody needs to have. And we have to think about the labor market, not from a perspective of a formal, formal economy only. We need to strengthen the formal economy. We need to, these economies to grow, but, and we have to prepare these young people for a gig economy perspective, right? Now, I know Misan has to go and I'd love for her to have maybe um, some parting thoughts before you have to go uh, to, to, your, to your board meeting. Um, thanks, thanks a bunch. I'm sorry that I have to leave early. Um, no, I think the, 
opportunities around rapid innovation that's being done by the social impact sector in tandem with the corporate sector. There's a huge openness. I think a lot of businesses are now on their knees as they've realized that if they don't get involved in the skilling sector, then they're not gonna have the talent pipeline. So the time is ripe for governments, for educators and for employers to work hand in hand to really get young people ready for work. So I'm very excited about that. Um, curriculum advocacy as these social impact organizations are innovating on what's the right set of skills to teach, what's the right uh, um, way in which to teach them to get it to stick, what's the right model for distribution a la the Netflix um, analogy that you've just used, and to continue to support people on the job, lifelong learning. Um, there is the opportunity to then integrate these innovations into curriculum because government is now open and willing. And I love when I hear about countries like uh, Rwanda that, you know, where Harambe is working with the government hand in hand, Ethiopia, where Kepler is working, um, where governments are just open to innovating and trying more things. So um, the time is ripe and I'm excited to, to see what comes of it. Thanks again for having me and sorry that I have to hop off early. Thank you, Misan. Thank um, you, Misan. <clears throat> so Ali, I, I think where, I, where I'm going to find a bit of a challenge is I'm not clear about the different pathways that um, folks like you, like, like Sharmi, like Misan are pursuing. Can you help me to think through or help organize this in a, in a way that makes sense? Are there some people that are saying, well, the government mechanism isn't going to work and so we're going to go outside of this. Some of them are working with the government. Help me to understand how you kind of um, look at the landscape and then try and respond using different pathways through this. So I, I think um, the, the, the evolution of, of, uh, of Harambe, but also the work that I'm doing at, at Instill in African Leadership University are probably a good way to think about how the, the sector is organized, right? Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that um, we've inherited a lot of the legacy from colonial era, but we've also had governance issues on the continent, right? Um, we've also, and I, and I say this, um, and I say this very frankly, we also seem to, uh, in, in many cases, glorify the way it's been done in the West, which sometimes restricts the way uh, the way we find solution spaces because the aspiration many policymakers that I work with tells me that I want to have an Harvard of Africa, and I'm like, that's cool. There's already Harvard. Can we think about the 10 million people that are gonna enter the workforce next year and how we think about that. So I, I think there's a, there's a group of people that are squarely working at the intersection of education and employment, both on the supply and demand side in, in the non-accredited space, right? It is easier to do that, that work um, when, you're, when you're not in highly regulated professions like teaching and, and places like that, you know, computer science and technology skills and digital skills that are actually shaping the world there's quite a lot of players playing in that space, right? Um, I also think there's a lot of institutions that are work, work, working squarely within the system, right? So institutions like mine are accredited higher education institutions who are playing the very uh, painful, slow role of just nudging the regulator in the right direction, right? But I, I do think that there is increasingly- and, and, and why do you do this? Why do you feel like you want to work with them? Is it because you believe that scalability ultimately you know, rests with, with government? You need to have that partnership in order to get your solutions rolled out? The, the, the thing I've learned the best with, uh, with my work at Harambi, and I, and, and I credit this a lot of work Sharmi and, and our CEO Mariana has done, is um, if you're going to make at scale difference at, um, on things that are related to education and employment, the government has to be your partner, right? I think I, I'm gonna misquote it, but I'm gonna use it anyways. I think Rudyard Kipling says that nothing scales like the bureaucracy, right? Um, the reality of it is you wanna make a difference in policy. And you know, some of you mentioned some of the policy changes and governance issues that need to change. You have to be willing to engage with government because otherwise that systemic change is harder to make, right? Um, it is harder to make, but it's also a long slog. So I understand institutions that basically sit and say, look, I'm actually going to work at the interface of corporate public sector training and non-accredited space. And there's value for that because somebody needs to fill the gap. But institutions like Sharmi, uh, that where Sharmi works at Harambi, have learned from the beginning that actually it's a multi-sector play. Uh, it takes a, I would say it takes a special type of institution to want to engage that and it takes an institution that are looking at the problem from a generational perspective, right? Um, 
moving government takes time, right? It's not just policy, it's politics and dynamics and labor market and vested interest. And you have to be willing to engage in those conversations quite well. Shami, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think all of what you said, and I think, so I'll give a couple of examples from my own experience, both as a member of, you know, an employee within Harambe and, you know, formerly with ALA, where the focus has been much more on entrepreneurship and sort of social enterprise, not necessarily policy and system wide change. So the big bet they've been making and we had made, you know, was investing heavily in a young person and heavily in, in sort of innovative thinking and social enterprise. Um, they have gone sort of an accreditation route with the university model, but there's different sub elements of the model which focus much more on enterprise education. And theirs is probably and remains one of the best enterprise education models in Africa for the just post tertiary level. Um, there's also another angle which is around, so, so I think there's a two or three categories to, to answer your question, Farouk. I think there's people, there's social enterprises that work as social enterprises, you, you know, R&D labs for the, for the economy and for society. There are social enterprises that partner extensively with government, whether it's through, um, for a scaling purpose, for systems-wide change, or in highly regulated environments where you need the accreditation and the institutional shifts to happen. I would say that there's also directly strengthening government as well. I mean, I'm on the board of an organization called Emerging Public Leaders, which focuses on bringing young people to technocratic work within government. And I do think all of the above is needed for us to shift the system in a, in a substantial way. So you need the social enterprises, you need the social enterprises to partner with government, to change government, and you need to directly transfer capacity to the government as well. Because um, I mean, the stat that Ali mentioned in terms of young people in Africa, Africa's governments are the oldest amongst the world, like our heads of state are the oldest in the world. So there's a huge disconnect between the state capacity and infrastructure, which is responsible for so much spending and has so much influence. And so we need to shift that from within as well. So there's, it's all of the above and definitely the private sector for, for sure. So I think for me, um, it's a multi-pronged, multi-stakeholder approach. And I think most social entrepreneurs across the continent are really comfortable with this mosaic approach and fairly and understand where they fit in and how to partner. I think the big question in the next few years, especially during COVID and beyond, is how do you shift that and how do you make this whole the sum of the uh, greater than the sum of the parts and work effectively together? Charmy, maybe um, it'd be great like just to bring to life this idea of how we work with government um, at Harambi. Maybe one or two examples, like specific example of how things changed. Sure. I mean, I think so. Our working with the government had been in Harambe's DNA from the very beginning. Um, so Harambe was, you know, funded by um, an investment holding company to address subsidiary organization vacancy. So the holding company was Yellowwoods. The the company subsidiaries were, you know, Hollard, which was an insurance company, Nando's, which provides chicken and is very famous for it across the world. And they had vacancy issues, and the heads of the businesses wanted to address that. And so. From a social enterprise perspective, um, Harambe was incubated to solve and address that problem, um, to say, can we bring unemployed people um, and train them and, and match them to jobs that exist? We were funded quite early on by um, something called the Jobs Fund, which was a national treasury initiative in South Africa um, and a public-private partnership designated to in encourage um, people to solve the jobs problem. So it would give social enterprises money to, um, as long as they were able to pathway young people into jobs. That funding I think was catalytic and allowed us to partner with government institutions across the board. So not just receive funding, but then partner actually with government. Our first initial partnership that was really successful was with the city of Johannesburg, which is an economic hub for South Africa. Then eventually with Gauteng Provincial Government, which is a layer above. And now we are actually partnering with the presidency at a national level. We are a national pathway manager for South Africa. In fact, we're literally in the middle of pathwaying, undertaking our biggest project ever with government where we've literally just completed a shortlisting and pathwaying of 300,000 young people to teaching assistant roles to support with safe reopening with um, COVID of schools across the country. So I think what working with government has told, taught us that infinite patience is required, um, but collaboration of this nature allows for maximum impact, like right now, where we're able to actually get in two weeks, 300,000 young people into stipended work across South Africa with sort of a data-driven platform. It's not without its drama, it's not without its downsides, but I think what we are seeing is working with government has significantly enhanced our ability to power a scale solution. In two weeks. 300,000, that's pretty, 
it's mad. And, I, and obviously I, I've seen that. It's crazy. Exactly. Um, look, I, I maybe had one more question before, uh, you know, Ferg, you can take over and open it up for, for a question. Um, Sharmi, you know, I have talked about this, right? And, and part of the solution space in the labor market is going to come from this gig gigification of the economy, the gig economy. Um, you wrote a really interesting article that I think most people uh, had a chance to read before coming around. Is that a dirty word? What are the implications around it? I'd love to have your point of view. Um, and, and part of it is because I, I struggle personally with the gig economy as a solution space um, for, for, for long-term solution space for dignified earning and learning um, and, and, and from a social justice perspective. So I'd love to at least just hear your thoughts and maybe we can talk about it. Sure. I mean, that article, yeah, I'm glad that some read it, but um, it's hard to, to, to sort of distill a complex um, problem like that in a few words. But gig, gig, the gig economy is the reality for so many young people in, on the African continent, both from, you know, and there's many words and concepts that are thrown around. There's the informal economy, there's the gig economy, etc. But if you speak to many young Africans across the continent, they will tell you that they're working on a side hustle, whether it's um, selling something on the side, airtime, um, secondhand clothes, um, helping out with their family business, etc. So the question is, it exists. How do you actually dignify it, I think is the question. And I think given that, you know, the jobs aren't coming, I think the earlier point that I'd made was how do you quantify and value that skill and the assets that young people are building to the labor market, to employers? And then flipping that, you know, how do you build institutions that protect young people? Because you see stories every single day of people who um, don't have contracts, that are um, don't have social protection, who are sent home and dismissed, and who are who um, are in the you know facing a lot of bias and discrimination. We hear stories every day of Uber and other kinds of um, labor market pl platforms that um, suffer from this as well. So I think there's no easy solution um, because there's it, it involves many institutions. But I think this is again, I believe, where the government needs to step in. But this is also where financial institutions need to think of how do you build insurance products for gig workers? How do you um, think of banking products for young workers? And I think Alim, you know, made the point earlier, uh, M-Pesa. M-Pesa has enabled both transactions and financial insurance for gig workers like probably no other. And I think that's probably why Kenya and East Africa in general has a very vibrant gig space. It still doesn't solve the social insurance and social protection space, but I think um, for me, this is a reality. So my, my question and my, my, my belief is that we need to actually dignify the work rather than avoiding it. So I think for me, it's like, let's come up with solutions that fit the reality of what young people are going through. I always want to disagree with you, Shami, but I, I usually can't. Um, I, I actually, maybe a, a twist to this, and I saw this question pop up earlier in the mix is, um, how do you see the, the gender dimension play out uh, both in the gig economy, uh, but also in the labor market? Sorry, is that a question for me, Alim? It is. It is. There's only oh, two. Okay. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, I think the gender piece is a is a key one. I mean, I um, there's many ways in which the gig space has actually helped young women access a labor market they wouldn't have otherwise because it allows for flexible hours. Um, and you can see that. I mean, there's also some folks from South Asia here that you might know, might be familiar with Misho, which is a digital reseller, um, in India <clears throat> that has predominantly young women and young housewives who don't have usually access to making uh, decisions around budgets, um, actually selling secondhand goods on the space, et cetera. So there's new and interesting ways that this impacts young women. I think the safety element is a key one. So I know that, for example, lots of algorithms um, that the driving platforms are thinking about are using actively using gender to bias or gender protection rather than, um, for example, you know, ensuring that young women get matched with female drivers, et cetera, et cetera. So those, there's different kinds of things within the gig space that can be done. I don't think it's a straightforward answer like with anything. Um, I have great admiration for organizations like Sweep South, for example, which is in South Africa and now in Kenya, <clears throat> which um, my friend Aisha Pandor runs. And it's basically a labor market matching platform that started out for domestic workers in South Africa, uh, but now it's expanding to both training and transitioning the young women in particular, because it's mostly a female role. 
um, to other jobs. And I think Aisha says it so beautifully because she says, domestic work is real and dignified work. That doesn't mean it's the only kind of work you need to do. Um, and more importantly, this is a stepping stone possibly to other kinds of work. Um, and I think Sweep South has actually won a lot of awards for being a really transparent and transformative kind of space and matching for, for young women to access jobs uh, that they wouldn't have otherwise. So I think there's with anything pros and cons um, so the gender dimensions is tricky to solve for, and um, like anywhere else in the world, um, African the African continent has actually suffered the most in terms of the women being taking taking the biggest hit for both COVID and a whole host of other things. But um, yeah, those are just some initial thoughts off the bat. Awesome. Well, on that note, maybe Farouk. Fantastic. No, thank you. Thank you for this. And, and I think we were going to talk about you know that specific gender dimension as well. I'm sure it's going to come up in the conversation. I think the best thing we can do now is just really open it up to questions. I know there's a lot of comments that have come in as well. I know some people have uh, sort of um, flagged that they want to um, ask some questions as well. So questions, questions from anyone in our course and then to the other people joining us as well. Joseph, I've seen your hand up for a while. I don't know whether you still have a question you wanted to ask. Perhaps not. Um, Alison, maybe you want to kick off with a question? That question was answered. Alison, you're, you're uh, muted. Well, uh, Sharni has actually uh, uh, started to answer it. I mean, I know it is a huge question. And, and my question in the chat was, you know, can we unpack the gender dimension uh, in this in this discussion? And I think you've started uh, to respond to that uh, in ways that you know are really very interesting to me. Um, you know, I'm also thinking of the uh, you know fa factoring in educational imbalances uh, and you know how girls are positioned to take advantage of new opportunities right from the get-go. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be very, very different across different um, parts of the African continent, also different uh, opportunities in formal and informal sectors. Anyway, you started to answer and, and uh, I was very satisfied with that, but if you've got any, any uh, else, anything else to add, I'd love to hear it. Um, maybe the only thing to add, and I, I think I keep bringing this up, I think the COVID-19 pandemic has both open, has both, you know, deepened the chasms of inequality across the world, and certainly in Africa, but it's also showed us these little windows of opportunity as to what could be different, right? And I think for me, both of those are really important to seize upon. And I think the gender dimension in particular, across every single country, you name it, you see dynamics of the gender impact, whether it's increased gender-based violence because of lockdown or loss of actual income opportunities, uh, informal and formal, the shutdown of schools impacting women most, um, and therefore locking them out of the labor market even more. Here in Kenya, there's been a 40% then greater uh, increase in teenage pregnancies. So for me, I think the gender question is front and center, I think it should be for every policymaker thinking of the space of social impact. Um, and I do think that, I think this crisis has actually helped trigger some specific kinds of responses that I hope that could help, you know, build a better solution for the future when, when things do return to hopefully a new normal. Can I just ask on a very particular question? Uh, I love the discussion about the... Alison, we, you're muted. I love the discussion about the hustler economy. Um, what is the balance between young men and young women who are taking part in that and in these, um, you know, the MBA program that you talked about or the... the, 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 the uh, uh, the other training opportunities. Are women taking advantage of those as well as men? I mean, you still have a gender gap across the board. I don't know the stats of the Hustler MBA of Shujas, but what I can tell is it's usually skewed towards men. I mean, the little work that we do, we have a, 
a small chatbot that we run a hustler chatbot in Rwanda, in Kenya, Rwanda, and it's free. Um, and if you have data, but um, the, most of the users end up being men um, for many reasons, because most of the young men have more disposable income or control their data allowances at the home um, and more time. And so, yes, that's definitely still a case, but we've tried to see how we can make it more attractive to young women using various ways as well. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Lacey? Hi guys, uh, thanks so much for the great conversation. Um, it's definitely um, in my area of passion as well. I'm currently working on creating Sorry, and I have a three and a half year old who likes to join in on my classes, but um, I'm currently working on a couple of programs for uh, career decision making, specifically for youth here in Nova Scotia. Um, and one of the things that I, I totally agree and a lot of there's obviously a lot of alignment between um, issues and, uh, and lots of differences as well. One of the things we've identified here in Nova Scotia is a need for um, exposing youth to more career opportunities. Um, and again, just that, that experiential learning part. So um, I really believe in the idea of job shadowing, of um, informational interviewing, just connecting youth more directly with actual employers. So my question is, um, obviously the government piece is huge, um, the youth piece is huge, but my question is around the employer piece and incentivizing employers to want to take part in this type of um, thinking and, and change and um, just moving forward. So obviously outside of offering them money, paying for um, employment opportunities for, for youth to come and work with them, what are the challenges and opportunities kind of in that space? Is there other ways to incentivize employers? Is it enough to tell them, you know, this is, your future pool of employees or you know I guess kind of along that area when we're out trying to um, change things and, and get employers to jump on board and and take people into their businesses knowing that there's going to be obviously costs associated with that for them um, just kind of are there any approaches that have worked well in getting employers on board I guess <laughs> <laughs> I could, yeah, I could quickly answer and then I have to jump off, unfortunately, because I have a, a, a call in a few minutes. But um, one of the things we do at Harambe and also what we used to do at Africa Careers Network, where I worked um, in African Leadership Academy, was um, a concept of a mock interview where it was not. So you actually had what we realized. Well, what I realized at ACN and Africa Careers Network was that yeah, um, employers are so much more eager to to meet young people when it's non-committal and they're actually more inclined to hire them when it's non-committal when rather than when you actually submit a job application so what we found was that a lot of our mock interviews people got jobs actually almost immediately after versus if you actually went through the, the original route and that was for slightly higher end jobs but even in, in harambe in mock interviews we um encouraged volunteers to actually conduct a mock interview for young people and they usually just walk away way very impressed and that interaction between the employer and someone they wouldn't have otherwise met is so much more powerful. That's not scalable, although we did do a bunch of mock interviews online uh, during COVID as well. So we're thinking of sort of innovative ways in which employers can meet young people. And so, yeah, I would encourage the sort of, whether it's job shadowing or mock interviews or any kinds of non sort of application oriented interactions as well. No, I, I have done that. I think that's the, the, the reality of it is you have to create more connections between young people that would never meet otherwise um, than not. And then so some of the, the experiment we had at, at the African Leadership University is just have people come on campus and meet people. Uh, again, not a career fair, not a just come on campus and meet, come and speak to people, do a, do a service, do a duty. I think that the second part, at least in, in, in the Harambi days when I used to work with, but I see this even in the work I do at the, at the university right now is um, the moment to position this as a corporate social responsibility, it then becomes that type of behavior, right? So uh, we always position everything as this will add value. It will incre increase the diversity of your organization. It will create better ideas, more, uh, more innovative things will come out of it. Uh, and so the, the battle of convincing them is no longer about 
it is your duty, our society needs it, but it's actually, we're solving a real problem you have. Uh, why don't you pilot it and give it a try? And at least uh, for the teacher training part, it's been a lot easier for us because as a new teacher training institution, a lot of schools look at us a bit like, well, you know, I'm happy to just keep going to my usual sources. And for us to start talking about it very differently about solving a real problem they have, which could be acquisition, it could be uh, mismatch in hiring, it could be um, just the effort it takes to find the people they're looking for, uh, suddenly has that conversation very differently. Uh, Uh, Jovina, did you have your hand up by any chance? Uh, Jovina? Yes, um, I've been following up and I've read some of articles. Um, education, it is the, um, a key factor which has been discussed and talked about. But my question was, yes, we are talking about a transformative kind of book of education and to change the, 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 the curriculums. Mm, but I was looking at that partnership which we are talking about between the government and the employers. We know that uh, employers have got different uh, value and different interest in this employment. I would like to know what kind or which sector of employers who are willing to participate in this kind of, 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 of partnership where we target it to um, make a job available to young people. But also for me, my concern is the, what kind of that is, of, of the job, uh, taking into consideration that if you go to the, those who are profit making, they would love to continue making profit out of those young people. How are they paid? How are they treated? What kind of job are they? Uh, providing to young people. Charmy, I know you have to go, so I'll let you just start the answer and I can maybe speak on behalf of my former employer afterward. Sure. Yeah, I think um, it's similar to what Aleem said. It's important to show an investment, not just a, it's not just a philanthropic or charitable um, act of investing in a young person. So we've at Harambe, for example, worked hard at demonstrating return on investment, whether it's speed of recruitment, efficiency, retention as well. We find that, you know, that makes a business want to invest in a young person. But we typically um, have had a lot of success within the financial services, um, sort of tourism and hospitality, um, retail, um, spaces. We also have had great success with the global business services, which is encompasses call centers and contact centers. Um, so a lot of young young people actually do end up succeeding in those roles. Um, but yeah, I think it is actually about convincing an employer, and it's you know I think it's a delicate dance also between HR and the business, and it's you know encouraging both parties because I think the business needs to want to invest in it as much as HR, and I think HR sometimes has you know bureaucracy that they may not be able to get out of. So um, it's all of the above. But unfortunately, I have to head off. But I'll hand back to to Aleem, who can speak a lot more about this as well. Thanks, Sharmi. Sharmi, we cannot thank you enough for this. Thanks for making the time. Thank you, Sharmi. So thanks, sir. Javina, just to add a bit more to that, to maybe to the, the second part of the question you, you, you put on the table, um, part of, I think, what makes Harambi and a lot of these institutions very successful, what they do is that data is key, right? So at Harambi, we just, it, it's not just the interaction that comes between a young person who gets placed into work um, that we track, we also track how long they stay in the job. And so there's quite a lot of behaviors that are happening in the workplace that are actually unacceptable, right? And these are behaviors that are hard for us to know about by default, right? It's hard to tell an employer is a bad employer um, in, that, in that world. And what it comes down to is we have an army of people whose job is to do advocacy with employers, to follow up on placements, to track the data and say, hey, wait a minute, we've, we, we put 100 people into work into this particular industry or this particular employer, and within three months, they've all disappeared and left that job, right? Is this really a dignified pl for, place for them to work? And we actually go spend some time intervene there. The same thing happens in the work we do at, uh, at the teacher training place. We're starting to engage with employers and we see teachers not survive more than a month, two months, three months with our partners. And it's important for us to understand why a teacher who's committed to young people disappears in the middle of a school term. And you can't do that without data. And, and again, the, the part of the work that I think is inspiring at least 
Harambee is definitely one. You should have a webinar just on Harambee, given their journey around this, this tripartite work that they do. But it's been this hard work of account managers. It's not about a skill training organi uh, organization only. It's not about just convincing employers to hire young people. It's not about government who has to think about policy change to drop the barriers, but it's about ruthlessly following up all the data that appears, right? Um, and if you're going to play a role of an ecosystem player like Harambi does, then you have to think of the ecosystem as all your partners. So another very simple example is, um, we, uh, we, we, we do assessments of young people um, you know, when they join our network, right? Very quickly, you'll find out that there are young people that have such difficult life experiences that they're not ready for a work professional environment. What they need is perhaps another NGO who's doing great work with gender-based violence or mental health or emotional health or loss, however they're struggling with. It could be as simple as they can't read because they haven't had good eyesight and nobody's actually diagnosed that, right? So you've given them training, but they can't actually see, right? So they're struggling. Well, we partner with all these institutions to say, hey, listen, these young people are coming to you because they actually, you, they need an intervention and support from you. And so the idea of an ecosystem player is to continue looking at the ecosystem and strengthening that while the government moves arguably much, much slower than the rest of the ecosystem. But I, I think the, the advice that at least the, the biggest lesson learned I've learned from my Harambee experience that we're applying at African Leadership University at Instill is um, engaging with government is something you start from the beginning. It's part of your DNA or it becomes really hard to do two years from now, right? Also, it, it does take government two, three, four years to actually move with you um, elsewhere. And especially if you're very unconventional, it's really, really hard. Um, I just want to point to one question that was there. I know we're out of time, Farouk, but there was a question Shahid asked about vocational training. Um, the, the, the vocational training story, at least on the African continent, is mixed. Um, and what I mean by mixed is social entrepreneurs have found uh, either really excited to solve the K-12 problems, so a lot of network of schools appearing that serve the affordable sector, the low-cost sector. A lot of people that are working in the in the skill boot camp, uh, you know, hustle economy type of space because there's a tech solution around it. And a lot of people go work in the tertiary education space, people like myself, who, uh, who are excited about higher education generally. The vocational uh, education system has, has arguably been the poor child of the education system, um, not just in Africa, but I've seen this pattern play out in a lot of economies. Um, at the same time, you're starting to see um, Government invested around in vocational education, but not in quality vocational education. So you're training people again, and then they're ending up in the labor market with completely mismatched skills to what the labor market needs, right? So there are, there is starting to, I, I am starting to see a lot of interesting inter, uh, uh, interventions. So uh, McKinsey's generation program in Kenya, for instance, delivers everything through the vocational network system. So the idea is to uplift the vocational uh, system to deliver skills that the labor market has done well. And McKinsey then holds the thinking around or, or the, the trend mapping of what's happening in the labor market and shares that with the Ministry of Labor to drive that. You're starting to see a, an institution in South Africa called Blue Lever driving that. There are government um, that, that have been much more uh, forward thinking about vocational education. Um, if you see that the mapping in Ethiopia right now, the, the framework is quite strong. The delivery is quite strong. They've adopted a very German approach to apprenticeship models and artisan models that is happening. The, the question that always comes back at the end of this is, um, I, I'll just give you a sense of the size of the challenge. We have about eight to 10% of young Africans that enter post-secondary education of any form, right? Uh, not just tertiary you know, universities, but just the whole post-secondary space. Uh, if you wanted to get to about 20%, 22%, which is the number of Nissan throughout there, um, you know, I think India is in the, the, the low 20s right now in the post-secondary space, you would have to create 500 institutions the size of Harvard's undergrad institution every year for the next 15 years to catch up. That's the, time, that's the size, right? If you wanted to just get to a, and I, it's a thumbs up, right? It's a, is it 300, is it 500? It is, what, it, it is a, a large number. 
And so the solution space seems to continuously coming back to government needs to come to the table. It's a long journey to work with them. Um, the social sector, the innovators have to keep pushing in the right direction and allow the innovation to, to grow. Um, and then the whole ecosystem has to come together to find solutions. So whether it's on financial inclusion, whether it's on, on insurance product, whether it's on uh, student loan products, whether it's on um, the gig economy, allowing people to create savings. So again, m has, has a really great program allowing people with little money to start investing their money and save and earn interest on it. All this is happening. And I think my, my framing to perhaps to all of you is, and I go back to the question Farouk asked earlier, my optimism lies on the fact that um, you have an incredible amount of people on the continent willing to test and experiment with unconventional ideas. And I see, at least as a, as a person working in the education and employment space, a lot of innovation coming out a lot of failures, but actually that's a great sign for me because it means people are trying new things and pushing boundaries uh, ever so slightly. Fantastic, Alim. Thank you so much for, for, for that. Thank you for helping to organize this. Um, it, it was wonderful to hear both Chami um, and, and Misan's perspective. It was really good to get your broader overview and all of this as well. And I guess, you know, for me, it, it is very encouraging to to see the three of you working in this space because there is so much to be done. The challenges are, 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 are incredibly difficult, but they're not insurmountable. Mm -hmm. and, and I know, Alim, you and I have known one another personally for so many years. I thought when you left McKinsey, you were going to now, you know, ride off into the sunset and retire, but here you are taking on a new challenge. Um, so I cannot thank you enough for sharing your passion with us today. I really appreciated what, what you were able to do. Are you comfortable with people reaching out to you if they have any additional questions or they want to uh, learn a little bit more about Instill? Is that okay with you? Absolutely, with pleasure. Um, I, I, I love having Sharmi and Nissan here because they're just incredibly inspiring women. And I love to just, I learned so much from them, but happy to share the rest of the story as well, both from both of them and from us. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, thank you again, Aleem. Thanks everyone. I know we are almost 10 minutes over, but we appreciate your patience. We appreciate you joining us today. For those of you in the course, we will see you tomorrow morning, same time, same place. We'll spend about an hour talking about uh, cryptocurrencies, and then we'll go into a conversation on the on the role of governance. You guess you wanted to add something in there? You're muted. Uh, we'll start an hour early uh, than than today. We start at eight. O'clock. That's right. So we're gonna same time, same place tomorrow, um, as as normal. Thank you everybody for this. Uh, we will see you, those of you in the course uh, tomorrow morning. And then others too, because tomorrow there is a webinar as well at nine o'clock. And, and right. I think basically, I think today's conversation, I was actually stuck by what uh, Aleem, you, you, you had to say about the role of the government. Uh, it's, it's not, it's how important it is if you want to take the solutions to, to scale. Uh, and I think our tomorrow's conversation actually is focused on the role of the government. So this is a good sort of prep for our uh, webinar tomorrow. So those who are interested, uh, it will be at the same time uh, tomorrow uh, at nine o'clock Atlantic. And for the for our class, we'll begin an hour earlier. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, we, we discussed your case in our class in, in Gibbs uh, in 2015, I think. And it's so nice to see this. it has evolved and has benefited so many people. So thank you so much once again. Everyone. All right, thanks again. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.